All right, it's six o'clock. We are going to call the meeting to order Wednesday, August 28th, for middle school uh, school committee meeting. First up, the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Um, first agenda item is to vote to approve the minutes of June 13th in July. Oh, sorry, good call. Uh -huh. Meeting's being recorded. Uh, if anyone else is recording, please just let us know. Not first agenda item. Uh -huh. Vote to approve the minutes from June 13th, 2024 meeting and our July 29th uh, open sessions meeting and our July 29th executive sessions meeting. We'll do them one at a time, just so everyone has it. Uh, first one, June 13th, 2024. Has everyone had a chance to review? Yeah. We have a motion to approve. Second. And all those in favor? Okay. Or zero one on sure. Uh, as for the July 29th, 2024 open session meetings, everyone have a chance to review? Mm -hmm. Motion to approve. So, second. 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 All those in favor? Aye. 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 And then our uh, July 29th executive session meeting. We also have to approve. Is that a roll call vote? Or is this? Uh -huh. a, no, same thing. Yes. All, right. um, all those in favor? Sorry, motion to approve. So, uh, Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Uh, number two, we will turn it over to Justine for the warrants. Um, I had I don't, I've never done this before. That's right. First time's ever back. So I'd like to report into public record the following school expense and payroll warrants reviewed and approved. And I go through all of them. Yes. You have to read them all into the market. Yep. School expense warrants, June 13th, 2024, 628,963.55. June 20th, 2024, 242,984.96. July 18th, 2024, 425,559.81 cents. July 29th, 2024, 321,628.24 cents. August 15th, 2024, 519,341.28 cents. School payroll warrants. May 30th, 2024, 1,223,379.47 cents. June 13th, 2024, 1,315,682.39. June 27th, 2024, 5,026,273.35. June 30th, 2024, 39,505.96. July 11th, 2024, 130,029.46. July 25th, 2024, 241,903.98. August 8th, 2024, 235,065.76. Excellent. Good job, Delray. Yeah, I'd like to enter those in public. Oh, I'd like to enter those in public. Thank you. All right. Uh, next up on the agenda will be Special Education Civil Rights Monitor Reports with uh, Ms. Russo and Dr. Nett. Don't all jump up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My parents get it up on the screen, but I have to follow along on mine. Sorry. <laughs> I think you can just. Yeah. You just tap. Just tap. I'm not going to do that. I'll you want me to tap? I'll tap. 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 I'll um, so, yeah, so we're here to talk about the special education civil rights tier folks monitoring for um, the 23 24 school year. Um, so, just a brief synopsis of what the tier focus monitoring is. Um, all districts in the state are reviewed every three years. It's a rotating um, process of what, what they look for. So, Group A is really looking at more of the, the student clarification, uh, identification pieces, um, making sure the development is there. And looking at program and supports and things along those lines. Group B is the more substantial of the two monitoring um, groups, and it's looking at lesson preparation development, uh, a lot of parent community engagement, 
facilities, um, and as you can see, oversight and, and a lot of other <laughs> other pieces here. So it's a pretty substantial um, amount of work that they're looking for for special education. Um, so the targeted standards that they're looking for um, when they come out to look for us are are we? Oh, in a different place. I'm sorry. Um, they're looking at, at school level uh, risk assessment data. They're looking at um, to see if there's potential issues or, or around those. There's two different sets that they're looking at. So there's universal standards and then the targeted standards. So but for special education, it's aligned with the 603 CMR um, Individuals with Disabilities with Disability Education Act, IDEA. Um, so it's just looking at all of the different standards that are aligned with special education law, both federally and at the state level. And then for civil rights, um, they're looking at the, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, as well as um, the physical restraint re regulations um, and the students' time on learning regulations as well. So Brian and I, um, and both well, special education and general education work together to really work on all these targeted areas that they've identified for us for this year. Um, determination of additional target areas can be done if there are um, Areas identified through PRS, so the Problem Resolution System, at DESE, and also in school safety and discipline reports that are state. So, so last year we had um, some some PRS complaints. So there are some additional areas that they wanted to look at when they came out to to look at us. Uh, we did not have any school safety or discipline reports where they look at the disparity between um, discipline for different groups of students, special education students of color, minority students, um, all students. So all of our reports there were were very clear and um, aligned with the state percentages. So that was not an area that they looked at for us. So for this year's unit B or group B TFM, um, special education had 33 targeted areas that they looked at. Um, some of them were just making sure that we had protocols and procedures in place for um, students who were receiving homebound hospital services, or that we had a letter to go out to families to let them know about um, all the different aspects of special education, essentially. There were three indicator areas as part of that. Um, one was identification of early childhood um, students, so the transition from early intervention into preschool. The other was um, evaluation timelines, so that we were following all of the evaluation, initial evaluation timelines. And the third indicator was transitions, um, age services, and that we were following all of those guidelines for students who were 14 to 22 years old. Um, for civil rights, Oh, and then we had one additional target area that which, which I mentioned earlier was identified through PRS, um, and that was to look at our um, use of timeout spaces and timeout documentation um, throughout the district. And then for civil rights, there were only three targeted areas. Yes. So those were um, benchmarking, curriculum upgrades, and parental communication. All right, so the process for the TFM um, is the self, there's a self assessment phase, um, which is almost a year in duration of us pulling all the records and submitting things and then getting feedback and then sending it back and uh, back and forth for, for months on the end, really, of all those things. Then there's the on site verification phase, and they were, um, Desi was here for two, three days. Three days. Three days they were out. Um, they then submit a draft summary of their findings to us. Um, which we have the opportunity to respond to if there's anything that we don't agree with or we have questions about. And then they send us the final report in July and we are then responsible for submitting an action plan to any of the steps along the way. So our self-assessment phase was from May 2023 to February of 2024. So just under a year, really, um, we were reviewing special education and civil rights documentation for all the required elements. So all 37 targeted areas that they wanted us to look at. Um, we reviewed a sample of special education records that we selected across the grade span. So what we did was put all of our special education names into one of those like auto generator list things. And um, they identified 17 records for us to pull. Um, so it was, I think we had records from all six buildings. So little answers up through the high school, um, out of district students, um, students in specialized programs, students who had AAC devices, students who were um, ELL students as well as special education and um, students who had um, significant discipline records as well. Um, we had a couple that met all criteria, which was lovely, <laughs> so it's good. Um, so we, we pulled all of those and we, we studied all of the records there. 
And then um, upon completion of that, the district self-assessment was submitted to the department for review. So it pulled all this information together and sent everything off to them in multiple spreadsheets for them to review. Um, in April of 2024, they came out to the, to Norton to um, to meet with us and to talk to everyone. So they then pulled an additional 12 records that they randomly selected um, while they were on site. And um, so they reviewed all of our full files for the self-assessments that we had identified and then pulled an additional 12 there to make sure that all of our procedural and programmatic stuff was in there um, to make sure that we weren't just doctoring up anything, I guess. Um, they also went through additional documents for special education and or civil rights. Uh, they, uh, the De Department of Ed sent out a survey to all families of students with special education, receiving special education services, asking a whole litany of questions of um, what types of services they, they were, their student was receiving, um, communication that they had with the school system, um, looking for feedback on both strengths and weaknesses of our department, and then to share that, all that information with us when they were here. Um, they also presented to CPAC um, through a virtual meeting, and they did some telephone interviews with CPAC members as well as some other families in the district. Um, and they were able to observe and visit all of our um, our specialized programs and buildings to see what we had to offer in the district. So scoring for tiered focus monitoring is done in four levels. Um, so. Tiers one and two are where you want to be, really. So um, self-directed improvement really just is some guidance of like, hey, we found this, but it's really not a big deal. Continue on with what you're doing. Everything is meeting requirements. Tier two is kind of low risk. Like there are kind of little some things here that you might want to keep an eye on, but really not a big deal. Tiers three and four where we get into corrective action. Um, so tier three is a corrective action plan. So we have, they found something wrong. It's a moderate risk, but it's not a huge deal. Um, tier four is where um, we have bigger issues, and that's when the department really but hones in and, and, and is a little bit more handholdy in terms of us um, continuing all the processes. So the findings for special education, so of the 33 target areas, 32 are being implemented and are in the tier one, with no, um, no concerns, no risk factors at all. One was being, is being partially implemented. Um, and then the one additional target area identified through PRS is, is an ongoing process that we have to update with them um, as we go along. Um, and then for the civil rights, the of the three targeted areas, two were being implemented and one is being partially implemented at this point. All right, so for the, so the corrective action plan, which was in our self-assessment, it was the um, indicator 11. So prior to them coming out in our self-assessment, the, in, the initial evaluation timelines, um, we were scored to be having an issue with this one, but it was really an error of debt entry rather than non-compliance. So um, in an initial evaluation, the, the initial evaluation was not completed within the 45 days. However, it was due to um, a, a, a student-related absence issue, but it was recorded in the system as the team not having met in time for, for a team reason. Um, we explained that to them. We've shared all of the documentation to back all of that information up, but because it was recorded that way in the system, they had to give us a corrective action for that. Um, so as a result, we are adjusting our data input methods and making sure that people are double checking and rechecking what they're putting into this into the, um, the spreadsheets. And then we also, um, yesterday during our opening day with the special education staff, we, uh, we did another training on evaluation timelines and just expressing the importance of making sure that we're meeting all of those deadlines. Um, and we've also got it in our, our IEP docking um, document for tracking all of our dates and things along those lines. We've got it very clearly laid out in there that we're meeting all of those um, timelines. And we shared that with the state as well. Um, the corrective action plan for the on-site phase was the transfer of parental rights, um, the age of majority. So we um, had made a mistake on a couple of things where, so transfer of rights is an age of majority is something that is, is done at every for every student on an IEP ahead of them turning 18, year ahead of them turning 18 to let, or year 17, um, to let them know that their educational decision-making rights may are changing when they turn 18. So it has to be done a year before they turn 17. So they have um, the information in a timely fashion to make decisions in a, in a well-informed manner. So um, all students when they turn 18 have, a have the decision-making rights um, of, for their IEP unless a shared decision-making or guardianship 
plan has been put in place with the family. This is just for educational decision making. It's not like legal, other medical or financial or anything like that, but just for students on an IEP. So we've been sending them all out um, during when the child was 17 um, or right before, but we had a couple that did not go out within that year long phase. So now um, we've made the adjustment that for a student who will be turning 17 during that IEP year, the age of majority will be discussed at that IEP meeting. So that'll be a change in process for some of our high school and out-of-district friends as well. Um, and we're, again, because we've updated the high school tracking sheet so they have a more consistent, um, cohesive timeline of tracking that information in a centralized location. Um, so the additional area that is um, was the, were the timeout rooms and the timeout spaces and using those in the elementary levels. So we actually applied for and received a federal timeout reduction grant. It's work, it's timeout reduction, but it's really about um, keeping kids in the general education classroom as much as possible. So um, we are working. So it, as part of this, we were able to upgrade the spaces, the time away spaces in the grit programs at all three elementary schools. The one the um, space at the LG is being rebuilt. Um, we had we moved the grit classroom at the Yale to a different location and, and built a space there. Um, and then the there at the JCS there was um, the grit classroom has two spaces and there was a foldable like accordion wall that was actually a cause for some safety concerns there. So we built a permanent wall with a uh, with a door um, to separate the two spaces so that wouldn't be an issue there. Um, and all of those were paid for through the timeout reduction grant that we received. So that was all grant monies to help pay for that. We're also collaborating with Walker Solutions. Um, it's a consulting branch of the Walker School, and we're doing Common Corners training with, um, with our staff. So this is a professional development opportunity that was shared with all of our pre-K to five general education classroom teachers. And it's to work on um, common spaces and strategies to keep kids in classroom settings. So just because, because a child is becoming dysregulated doesn't mean they need to leave the general education classroom setting, but providing the materials and training to, for teachers to have a space in their classroom for children to, to self-regulate or, or re-regulate um, or just kind of take a moment away in a calm space. Um, we, as part of the grant, we had enough to do 30 classrooms. And right now we've had, I think 20 teachers have signed on to do so. Um, I have to give a big shout out to the JCS kindergarten team. They all committed and they wanted to do this as a group um, so that all the kindergarten students at JCS have the same experience. Um, and I believe they're going, the kindergarten team at the LG is going to be doing it as well. So um, if we can really front load those skills to teach kids how to regulate in the classroom setting, hoping they can carry it forward as they, as they move on. Um, the also the um, best and great elementary classroom teachers will also be going through the training, but at a different level as they have the skills already. So we're going to be doing it at a different level for them. And then the corrective action plan for civil rights, Brian, I'm going to hand that over to you. Sure. So we um, had three areas that were identified. And like Casey said, you really are looking at those buckets one and two as being close to compliant and then three and four. So for us, these were close, but not, not quite yet. So really there were three pieces that we were looking at. So number one was the ELL curriculum. And so um, the, the monitoring agent really would like for us to have more dedicated resources, more uniformity, more of consistent availability to access for uh, content to kids. The second was in identification of EL learners. So we need to revamp and bring together our benchmarking and progress monitoring, because again, we have it, but we're not as consistent as we need to be across the schools, but that's going to be an action step that we're going to take. And then the third is the incorporation of SEI strategies and content area classes. We have a number of folks that are SEI, which stands for sheltered English immersion. Um, but during the visit, they found that we were um, doing a little bit too much translation and we need to build our teacher capacity to deliver instruction. And so um, <clears throat> for the curriculum piece, just to give the, the school committee an update, we began meeting in July. So a few of the EL folks were kind enough to comment and look at a couple of sets of curriculum materials and resources. Then what we will be doing next is we're going to continue to review the materials and our hope is to field test during 
these fall months once we've identified those materials. And the goal is by the end of the year to have <clears throat> materials ready for implementation. For identification of EL learners, um, we are need to be um, a little bit more focused on data and have uniformity of data use and really update our benchmarking so that we have consistency and universal practice. Um, we started some of that work and we're going to continue that work through the year. And then the last piece is the integration of SEI strategies and content areas. So we have three ways that we're going to offer our folks an opportunity for SEI endorsement. Number one is DESE is running a free uh, retail SEI program. I have received a list of about 10 teachers at this point. The final list will be communicated to DESE, and then DESE will schedule the logistics for this event. The second pathway is we have French River Educational Collaborative as a partner this year, and they offer what uh, I call a hybrid course. So that can be partially online, partially in person, sequence and space throughout the year, because we know people are busy, we know sometimes that they might not be able to commit to all or one thing. So we wanted to provide those multiple pathways to get our all of our folks uh, SEI endorsed. Again, of the list, almost all of our folks were endorsed, but there were a few that were not. And additionally, what we found is that there are some people that want to get the, the, light, um, the endorsement as well. So it's actually going to serve the collective good too. Yeah, so our next step is that we have to submit um, our corrective action plan progress report to DESE um, by Friday. And um, again, all the things that we just shared with you are the things that we'll be updating them with. Um, and then we'll get a, a report back from them a few weeks later, and then we'll have to set, submit our final corrective action to them by the end of September. So, where do we stand? Yeah. I have to just, number one, say, like, give kudos to Casey oh. and Vinny oh, and Brian, because as Casey described to you, the amount of time and paperwork management and file deep diving that goes into this process is incredible. It, it is an extremely time consuming process. Um, and to see results like this, when they're looking at so many different indicators, um, I was really pleased. Like when you're looking through the report, like you can go through it pretty quick because it's, you know, we are in compliance with, with nearly everything. Um, as someone who oversaw the ELL program for a number of years, there was nothing surprising, I think to either Brian or I, and that's what happens when you start with a small group of L students that kind of exponentially grows mm -hmm. over time. Um, but, and, you know, kudos to all of them. Uh, just, you know, it's a huge undertaking and they did a great job. Well, and I think on top of all of that, you're learning and switching over to the new IEP. So like, that's a lot. Yeah. So it was actually really interesting um, <laughs> because we were the first. <laughs> <Right. laughs> um, I love that thing. <laughs> So when they came out, they actually were very, they actually had cited us in a couple of different areas because um, it, it, if you've seen the new IEP, things are, it's all the same information, but it's presented in a much different format and things are in different places and all over the place. And um, they, they cited us for not including information in some of the IEPs. And I was like, actually, this is the new IEP and that information is here and not there. And they were like, Oh, <laughs> like so we were the first they, well, I mean we were the first district that they had done a TFM for that is had started with the new IEP already. Mm -hmm. So we were actually able to educate Desi on Desi. You know? <laughs> so that was probably shouldn't say that on the but, but um you learned from we, we, we did. Yeah, exactly. We did. So but it but it was it was very it was nice for them to be able to see what it looked like and how cumbersome some of the IEPs were with us trying to Tetris pieces of the old one into the new one and and make it all work um so it but yeah it was it was challenging <laughs> a lot of time yeah any other questions comments concerns I guess my only one is you know obviously when we talk about like the curriculum stuff mm -hmm. I don't think we're making any major changes but obviously you know curriculum can be expensive if something comes up, <laughs> if something comes up along the lines of like, you know, we need to, and maybe it's not this year, mm -hmm. two, three, five years down the road, whatever it may be, would the state be open to sending us more dollars to update that curriculum? 
I would hope that the answer to that would be yes, but I can't speak for Desi. What I have done for the last two years for our Title III grant, and it's not a lot of money, but there's two significant bins of set-asides so that when we make that decision, we will at least have some of the capacity to do that. And again, I want to say none of those dollars are local dollars. Those are federal grant funds. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to be, you know, kind of begin with the end in mind mm -hmm. so that we can squirrel away pockets to offset any costs. We also have um, a small amount of money from um, our students that were newcomers last year that we only had three students. We received $104 per student per day from the department. Um, so that money is also eligible um, to go towards these curriculum purchases as well. So um, there are funds that we've already spent in terms of transportation and other things, but um, there is a little bit left that we can put towards this as well. Great, anything else? Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Hartman, good morning. Very narrow. Yeah, you. no, I, I need to go from one chair right now. Uh, IMTSS plans the next steps. Oh, maybe if you go back. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to watch it so I can do this properly. Thank you. <laughs> So one of the things I think that's really important is to always start with why, right? Everything that we do has an intention, it's a purpose. And so IMTSS, to go back to the Norton Vision 2026, is an integral part of the district strategic plan. And really one of the highest priorities in all of this work is we want to provide all of our students with what we call just-in-time support which means that when we notice that something isn't the way we want it to be, we don't wait and we can be proactive and identify uh, a way to help those students. Um, remember, we always focus on the whole student. It's academic, it's behavioral, and it's social emotional. And additionally for us, our next step is to really establish some district-wide protocols to look at student data and have a universal way to filter those results that leads to actions kids. So for tonight, we're going to go back a little bit before we go forward, update a little bit on what's coming next. I want to do, I want to call out some successes because we have had an amazing faculty that has really risen to the occasion. And I think it's really worth in a public space celebrating those successes. And then to be candid and honest and identify we are still a work in progress. And IMTSS to do well takes several years, and that's okay. Um, but we want to be with full understanding of where we need to go. So I think one of the biggest, most essential pieces was that tier one foundational K to eight curriculum piece. So in 2023, 23, I think it's been a long day. Any day is like the Super Bowl for the Office of Teaching and Learning. It's, it's a long day. So we're really proud of what we've been able to do to implement our elementary math program, Stepping Stones. We're really proud to be able to have implemented a middle school math and a middle school ELA program. Really good. Today was spent year two for our middle school folks. So in this very space, mid-school math was back here and then down the hall was Amplify ELA. So building teacher knowledge and sharing practice is a multi-year process. And we wanna really be attentive to what our staff needs. Additionally, um, as we all know, we spent a lot of time last year, we selected a high quality ELA program for our elementary folks. And today, everybody braved the heat, and we had our first kind of formal rollout in person with interreading, and that will continue all year. I'll get to a little bit more detail on that in our in our next slide. Another thing um, that we want to really be intentional about is looking at grants. We try to find and access any pools of money that we can because we know there are fiscal challenges. 
So last year, we used our uh, acceleration academies during the vacation. That was almost 190,000. Um, I will speak more about the chronic absenteeism grant. Um, additionally, uh, this afternoon, I had the pleasure of meeting with the Norton Middle School um, science folks. So we're starting to put together our implementation plan for this year's Mass Life Sciences. So we will be getting, hopefully tomorrow, um, microscopes, triple beam balances, and other science materials that can really upgrade the science experience at the middle school. And Casey referenced this a little bit earlier, the new IEP grant as well. And one really important thing to mention about that is the new IEP grant is dedicated for students with IEPs, but as Casey alluded to, it's preventative for all of us. And so if we think about IMTSS, all of our students are all of our students. Everything we do is integrated. Last year, we had a new social emotional curriculum, Character Strong in K to 8. Uh, Character Strong really focused on um, a sense of belonging, a sense of community, a sense of kindness. And Character Strong in 6 to 8 was really about interactive, bringing students together. I had a chance to witness a couple of those lessons last year, and they start with an interactive kind of like vanilla ice cream or chocolate ice cream. Which one do you like? And then the kids go into groups, and then that facilitates a larger discussion about connectivity and preferences and things like that. It really, really was um, helpful for us. Social emotional as well. So last year we ran a pilot for Navigate 360 in the high school, I believe it was in the bridge program, really about addressing a sense of connectivity and belongingness. Um, we are going with a full implementation for Navigate 360 this year in the high school. So that will be for all students. Students in the high school also uh, participated in MyCap. And MyCap is a really purposeful outcome oriented program about planning for when you leave high school. So it's really focused on goals and objectives, housing, living, to really try and crystallize with, with our high school students. High school does end. It's wonderful, but it ends. And we want to make sure that we're ready to take on that next step. And then kind of the final piece was uh, the J Jed High School. Um, I'm sure you've heard about Jed High School before, but it's all about suicide prevention and for belonging. I know last year at the high school, they really used a data-driven approach to try and identify one or two key areas for students to really help us move them forward. So that was some of the social emotional work last year. Yeah, and say, Brian, all that was, all of that was great fun. Additionally, at the high school, so we had year two, it was a two year um, program, again, grant funded, no local funds for PBL works. We had um, developments of units of study. So that, again, that was year two. All Norton High School students completed at least one unit. And over the two year period, we had over 50 Norton High School staff members participate. Um, and if you look back specifically at the strategic plan, that goal has been met. So we can check that off the box. I know one of the things, and this is an area what I would call of evolution for us is we're doing all the work. Well. We're seeing students make progress. How do we track it? And how do we create a system that's longitudinal in a way that if I'm going from JCS to Henry AL, how can I or as the fourth grade teacher, access that all, in, all of that information. So we started this last year with Panorama Education to try to use it for our hub. And Panorama allows all your teachers to see educational, attendance, and social emotional data. We did a fair amount of PD in 23-24 of first nuts and bolts. Like, how do you use Panorama? What buttons do you click? How do you create a plan? Who can manage the plan? Who's responsible? because all the schools have used it, but to varying degrees and for different purposes. I'm gonna be honest, we are not there yet. This is gonna take some more time to do, but we wanted to have movement towards more uniformity in how we capture all the great academic, social, emotional work that we do. 
So I know the question is always about data. So we're doing all this work. What does our data show us? And how can we either celebrate what we've done or say, you know what, we've got to go back to the drawing board. There are a number of different ways to capture this. One way that I think is really important for our work is something called using student growth percentile as a way to capture data. And so think of student growth percentile as capturing an individual student and comparing that student to a nationally normed sample size of hundreds of thousands of kids. So for example, if Justine on her initial score was off the charts and I was really low, comparing the two of us may not be the best way. But if Justine is very high and Nick is very high, Comparing their results actually says a lot because it shows growth. So that was really kind of the impetus behind this. And so when you look at data and data from STAR, if you're in the 66th percentile or above, that's considered high growth. So that means that student had an achievement level at or greater than two thirds of their commencement fields. What we should reasonably expect in a year for all of our students is every, anywhere between the 30th and 65th percentile. That's a broad measure, that's a broad baseline. If we're doing that, we're doing okay. If we have our students below the 30th percentile, 35th percentile, that gives us a motivation to redouble our efforts and to look even more specifically at where students may need additional support. So I'm gonna share with you two very broad district um, level scores. So last year, based upon the STAR assessment that all students from grades K through 10 take, we had om almost 70% of our students have either typical or high growth. It's a nice starting point. It by no means means it by no me way means the work is done. We still have much more to do. Our collective SGP for reading, again, was almost, you know, almost two thirds of those kids made typical or high growth. We're never satisfied with even having one student in the low growth category. So that high level data kind of gives us an overview of, I think, some, some progress that, that's commendable, but it also means we have a lot more work. Additionally, one of the things that our leadership team did to help inform our professional development, to help inform our staff, is we actually looked at data together. And many of us participated in an online course called DataWise from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And it really was about kind of what I articulated earlier about looking at data a particular way. This summer, we did a book study um, to collectively called MeetingWise. And MeetingWise was about thinking really efficiency about all the things we have to do, all the meetings we have to have, how do we maximize our time? How do we get the best ROI on the time we have to invest? And then the last part, our uh, leadership team during the um, summer retreat, we actually laid chart paper across these tables and we did the data analysis ourselves. And we worked together as a group to look at cohorts of kids. So have hypotheses about what went well, what didn't go well. If we were the classroom teacher, how would we group these students? What would the intervention be? Because we have to model what we expect our folks to do. And so I'm sure you've seen this before. I think our staff, have you guys seen this before? <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's really that triangle. So, so much of this year, especially with the curriculum adoption, was building that foundational support, that academic piece. The other re things that we referenced is about the timeout, a timeout grant as well, the social emotional wellness, the SEL curriculums. It covers those pieces. This piece I'm going to address in a minute because we've identified it as a need. 
and we're going to talk about a couple of next steps that we're going to take. And so here we are, 24-25. We are a busy place, and we have a lot happening. And I, I again, I want to laud and commend the staff. People are embracing it, and we're moving. So we're really looking at those four core curriculum adoptions, Character Strong, Navigate 360. Um, shout out to Karen and to Jen, onboarding Power School. Like, to do all this at once is a huge lift, but it, again, it all connects to making our students be the best version of themselves. And so one last piece I wanted to speak on is the attendance piece, because we have found, and this is not um, unique to Norton, it's also in, uh, across the Commonwealth. Has anyone seen Secretary Tutwiler's um, commercial about going back to school? Yeah, it, it is really a big push right now. Usually when I change the channel. <laughs> <laughs> so dry. <laughs> so it really, it really is about school attendance. And Norton is not unique, but our rates of chronic absenteeism are higher than any of us would like. And we're particularly disproportionately impacted with students with disabilities, students with language needs. So we've got we've got so, some work to do. So last year, I had referenced this earlier, we got a $10,000 DESE grant. We formed a district-wide team and started to update the handbooks to look at chronic absenteeism. You will start seeing, I'm going to be out tomorrow because we're coming back on Monday. You're going to see these signs. And these signs are really about being in front of our schools just so we can have that positive message of encouragement. We want you here. We want to be proactive. We want to have that welcoming, warming signage because our job is to re remove as many barriers as possible. So again, for PD, Power School, more curriculum adoptions. One thing I'll say about curriculum adoptions, is we're going to have a number of in-district coaching days. So for those new and second year curricula, we're actually going to have providers come back, work with our teachers in classrooms, and then use early release afternoons to debrief and talk about teaching and learning. We're going to continue with database decision making. We uh, are also partnered with the University of Missouri. So our consultants from the University of Missouri are now actively meeting with our principals, either in groups or one to one, to kind of identify unique challenges that are, that are at every building because every building has a slightly different schedule, slightly different number of kids. So we're trying to really be a little bit more pinpointed now in terms of helping individual buildings be attentive to this. And then Casey referenced the new IEP. And then the last piece is uh, Norton High School is going to be preparing for the decennial visit. So that is not this year, but it's next year. So there are some curriculum maps, some curriculum documents that need to be updated. But again, it's all integrated into IMTSS, but that's going to be, particularly in the spring, the crux of the work at the high school. Brian, can you just explain to everyone what the decennial visit is? Yes. So um, NEASC, right? I have so many acronyms. Yeah, that I <laughs> you have to get accredited to be a public high school. Um, you have to meet certain thresholds, certain criteria. So you have to have certain levels of programming, access and availability. So the decennial, if my prefixes are right, is every 10 years. So that's that's a big deal. Um, I actually went for my first uh, visit last year, not to a decennial, but it's a super involved process where a bunch of folks come in and they embed themselves in the school for two or three days. They meet with students, they meet with parents, they look at documents, they look at curriculum, and they just want to have that super deep dive into what the school does. And then there's a very extensive report writing period where the group comes together over several hours to produce a final report. And if you have all of the programs, if you have all the curricula, if you have common assessments, you usually do just fine. Actually, had school committee members when they came last time. 
Just yeah. my first year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So well, they, they will when they come for the ten year. Well, the funny thing is, my former principal at my high school was a member. <laughs> I knew him outside of high school. So he recognized you right away. And that's why we have a good rating. <laughs> <laughs> I must have been it. <laughs> uh, so I know we've covered a lot. I'm not going to reread these. But we are a very busy place, even in light of, you know, everything else that's happening. Teaching and learning is still foregrounded here. We have staff that have committed and are really doing exceptional work, and we're going to keep moving forward. So what are the biggest challenges? They are the same that they are in almost everything else, time and money. So we try to be as creative as we can, as innovative as we can look to find those reservoirs of dollars to support our work that don't offset the local budget, we're going to continue to do that. Time, our, today is our loan fully dedicated PD day. We have early release days, but as part of what spills into all of our work on like potential changes, the schedule makes it a challenge. And then schedules are thin schedules. So trying to find all of those layers to find those intersection points to really get people together to do that work is something that continues to be a challenge. But as I've said multiple times, no matter what else happens, this is who we are, this is what we do, and we're gonna keep taking steps forward. I have one question on the, on the 2024, 25 next steps. So this is everything we're we're trying to put into play for this school year. Yes. So my only, I guess, call out is what I would like to see is maybe something like an April meeting. Mm -hmm. See where we're at and see if we think we're gonna make it to the finish line by June. Just more of an update, you know. Of course. Like April ish, like after vacation or one whatever meeting. Sounds uh, great. Just because I'd be curious to see. Because we're looking at time and money and everything else that if we really need to kick some of these into the next school year or if we're going to be successful and hopefully we are successful in getting everything. Okay. Absolutely. And some of these, you know, certainly are going to be multi-year efforts. But, you know, even in looking at, because even when I wrote this, I referred back specifically to the district plan. We really are trying to meet all those intermediate checkpoints within the timelines provided. Um, and we'll just, we're going to keep at it, but I think dancing mm -hmm. to your point, I think, uh, an update would, would be great. I'm curious if you have any, um, like on these mm -hmm. charts, um, because there was new curriculum implemented this past school year. Yes. Like if the, I don't know if you can compare data, cause obviously like kids have graduated mm -hmm. and you know, whatever, but I'm just curious, like. Has the high growth and the typical growth is that greater mm -hmm. this past school year than the previous school year with the new programs or mm -hmm. like, I don't know. So I could certainly go back and, and find that um, where there are so many ways in star yeah. to all data. And I wanted to, at least for the purpose of, of this, try to be like straightforward, but without question, you can split atoms in star um, and really find lots of things. You know, really we wanted to try for tonight to find yeah. something that maybe could be, but but I, I could absolutely go back and find that. And I think a uh, follow up to that, we're, uh, and I'm, obviously we can break down STAR. <clears throat> if we took our math and reading growth scores, if you will, and we compare them possibly like regionally and nationally. So like, and again, if the low growth is 31% in our district, mm -hmm. regionally it's 35%, exactly. nationally it's 40%. We yeah. know we're growing mm -hmm. at a higher rate, which is great. If it's the opposite, you know, and where, you know, our growth is lower than, than regional, we'll kind of, sure. it'll be, again, I think for from our standpoint, it's always those data points of like, where are we, you know, where, how can we get better? Where, where, you know, obviously looking at these quick numbers, mm -hmm. we seem to be doing better in math than we are in reading. Mm -hmm. Does that have something to do with the new curriculum? Does a new curriculum coming in for our, for ELA, you know, in the elementary schools, is that going to box us up? So I think if we can get a little bit more, sure, 
you know, from what Justine said, you know, from year to year, I know it's not ideal, but same thing. Yeah. With the so <clears throat> there's a couple of things with STAR. So not every district uses STAR. Correct. So a lot of districts use another program called iReady. Some use Dibbles. Yeah, yeah. So finding a comparison <laughs> district um, that's willing to share their information with us might be tricky. Okay. For better or for worse, it's why MCAS is helpful because we know, we all know that there are foibles within MCAS, but it is a true apples to apples because everybody takes it. Yeah. 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 Well, one thing about STAR, and I would just caution, right, is that you could do state comparison. Yeah. So it would take all the state data for anyone that um, tests within Massachusetts. You can also do national. Mm -hmm. And just like um, they rate all of like every state every year, like what, so you're getting Massachusetts data, but you're also getting Kentucky. I was gonna say Alabama, right. but yes. <laughs> um, so it's, you know, it, it has the same caveats as when we look at MCAS data and we say, okay, Norton versus Springfield, right? So it's, it's you just have to kind of take some of those things with the understanding that there's a whole bunch of Different communities makes right. sense. Right. Sure. Yeah. But I think that would be Justine's point too, that we get that broken down from what we do year to year. Mm -hmm. And again, with any data, there's always going to be room for error. Sure. And, and yeah. everything's going to get a little, sure. you know, wacky anyway. But if we can kind of see it from what we're doing, mm -hmm. you know, because again, you know, we've talked about this multiple times here and, and with you as well. It's just like to be able to see it, to see if it actually worked. You know, that's our biggest thing. It's like we, everyone's here, student success wise, that's what we all care about. And to actually see that yeah. in a chart, it would be awesome. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. And I think what would be really, you know, powerful, especially when we get a couple of years in and everybody's really comfortable, that's when we're going to likely see Correct. The, the biggest shifts. Mm -hmm. so, and, I mean, what would be great is as we go through, you know, this thing in three, four, five years. That red number is getting smaller and the green ones are getting bigger, you know, and then we can say, hey, this is working, you know, absolutely. Or, or us, you know, and then we can kind of figure out what we're going to do then. Absolutely. Any other questions? I had a question just on Power School. Is that going out to every period? No. So, Power School is going to be a universal school information system. So, everybody is going to be using it. Yes. Um, that is part of a multi year. So, we yes. started doing this last September, October. It replaces school brains. Yeah. Um, so, I know, like, Mrs. Whisper is person. here. I don't know if she wants to. She spent a whole day talking about yes. our school. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know if she wants to jump in. Um, her, 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 her ears ring for a minute. Like, <laughs> so, not every parent is going to get a, a parent portal account. Okay because at the elementary level, we use standard-based grading. So at this point, there's not a way that PowerSchool does um, standards-based grading in the portal. The middle school and high school, like we did with school brains, they will absolutely, parents will have um, portal access. We're kind of <clears throat> slow rolling it. Some parents are like, can I have access now? And I said, <laughs> yes, we will get you access soon. Um, but we were really trying to get the kids access so that they could have um, their schedules and such. Probably within the first two weeks, we'll have access for all the parents. We'll send that out. Um, but yes, so far, knock on wood, we have been without a hitch. There it goes. It's a little bit. There you go. All right, next up, um, everyone's favorite subject, budget. All right, uh, thank you. So Christine and I just have a few updates for you tonight. Um, as we shared with you at our July meeting, um, we have um, staffing changes for you. Um, since we met at the end of July, we have had eight additional staffing changes, um, some as recently as <laughs> the beginning of this week. Um, we had two additional retirements, five additional resignations and um, one um, FTE request, a staff member requested to go from full time down to part time. Um, the other document that we shared with you is the savings sheet. 
So these are every um, staffing change that has taken place after our budget was set. So um, as the school committee is familiar, we anticipated some budget savings when we were trying to get down to that 1%. Um, these are savings over and above that amount. Um, the total savings that we have seen so far is $337,000. Um, I wanna be really clear about how this savings happens um, because there is a misunderstanding that we find this money. That's not what happens. Um, for example, we have a um, science teacher that decides to resign for you know, $91,000 and then you're able to hire somebody for $76,000. So that savings there is, is what we are making up that $337,000 with. For example, special education teacher resigned. That was an $89,000 salary. The new teacher was hired at $51,000 for total savings of $37,000. Um, these are not new positions that we've hired. These are all um, positions that were part of our, our budget, part of the 1% budget. And um, as staffing changes, as people leave or come in, um, we're trying really, really hard um, in most occasions is to hire someone that is really high quality, but also costs a little bit less. And as you guys can see, there's probably you know 15 different examples here, and there's only one who we were not able to hire someone um, at less than that person going out. Um, and that's a science position, which makes it it can be really difficult to find a secondary science teacher. So um, sharing that with you, um, if I was to you know find three hundred thirty-seven thousand dollars worth of savings in my own personal budget, that would be like you know, amazing. Um, it's not a huge amount of money when it comes to a $34 million budget. Um, since we last met, we have brought back our sixth nurse. Um, I mentioned to the committee at our last July meeting, that was the thing I was most concerned about. Um, we have a number of students that have significant medical needs, um, and having that extra person really, um, helps with making sure that students are being monitored appropriately, getting their medications at the right time, um, and just a general sense of safety and well-being. Um, it's also extremely difficult to find substitute nurses. So knowing that we have that other person that's able to fill in at a building, um, if that need comes up, um, is, is makes me feel much better. Um, we have also um, brought back um, or, re or hired two paraprofessionals uh, for a total of $60,000 that um, these are based on student need. So potentially a new student moving to town that has specific needs or coming back from a different placement. Um, these positions are required and mandated by law. Um, and then finally, um, we are moving forward with a security upgrade for our uh, network. Um, as the committee knows, and as most people know, we had a network incident in late June. Um, and which requires us to update our security system um, to ensure that we are now meeting the minimum threshold for our insurance company as we move forward. Um, so taking those things into consideration, we have about $134,000 left in our savings account. Um, it goes very fast. It's definitely not as much as I would like to have at this point in the year. Um, we are still working on backfilling at least two paraprofessional positions from resignations or moves within the within the district, um, and we're hoping that we'll have those fully staffed by Tuesday when our students arrive. Questions, concerns? I guess my only one, just because it kind of rung a bell a little bit. Um, the first position on the on our changes, the guidance counselor at the high school. RAF reduction force. Yep. So did we that was part of the cuts, correct? Why did we hire someone new? Um, it was not a it's it was a mutual parting of ways. So we went from four counselors down to three. Two counselors did not return. We had to re backfill that one position. So I, I don't know if riff's the right language, but um I think that was it. 
Anything else? Uh, next up, we'll, we'll, oh, sorry, <laughs> just because when you said, when you, have we seen any increase from any, you know, from the apartment buildings or any of the new homes? Like, we haven't seen any. Not yet. yet. Um, not yet. Um, my understanding is that Norton Links, which is the 100 unit complex, yeah, that's, yeah, that's which is Norton Links is right next to Great Woods Plaza. Yeah, right next to Great Woods Plaza. Um, I don't believe though they're open yet. Um, but if they, when they do, that is a JCS um, district. And so I'm a little bit worried about the kindergarten numbers at JCS right now. Um, we have uh, about 22, 23 students per classroom over there um, compared to LGM where it's about 19, 20. Um, I'm a little worried about those numbers and it will depend on, you know, who we see coming in, but not at this point. So we haven't had anyone say, I plan to move on these and coming from not yet um in the special education office we've had a couple of families who have called just saying we may be moving to norton um but not specific location as to the apartments or anything like that but we've had a couple of inquiry calls everyone wants to come to me <laughs> <laughs> right um Update on middle school band and course. Okay. Go ahead. Um, so last week I was able to come to an agreement with the Norton Teachers Association on um, having middle school band and chorus as part of our after school um, club program. So what we needed to kind of decide on was um, what that stipend rate would look like. Um, so uh, that has not yet been factored into those savings, but will come. From those savings and the way that we came to that agreement is we looked at what the current stipends are um, at the middle school and we likened it to more of an intramural which meets 25 times per trimester um, not necessarily a club um, so this would meet a little bit more often um, and hopefully would meet every single trimester so that stipend would be awarded to the individual teacher um, three times throughout the course of the year so those positions have been posted. Um, they are out there and um, available for our Norton staff. If we are not able to backfill or to fill those stipend in positions, um, we'll post them externally as well to see if there are other music educators that would be interested in um, advising our after school clubs. Um, and the way that would work is that uh, typically every year for parents who have a middle schooler, um, second or third week of school, Mr. Hayward sends out this big, huge email with all of the middle school clubs. Um, these are the offerings. These are the options. And um, families are able to look at the options with their students and sign up for them at that time. Um, there is a cost to clubs. There will be a cost, the same cost to participate in the Banting Chorus, um, which will ideally offset that stipend a little bit. It won't offset it fully. Um, but until we have an advisor, um, we're, we're waiting on that. And it will also, based on the schedule, will really depend on the advisor and what their availability is. So for example, if it was Mr. Place, um, he may not be able to you know, do right after school on the days that he's at JCS. If it was someone from the high school, that might be different. So um, those have been posted. and. I hope that we'll um, be able to um, find someone to do that. So will, will band and chorus be one? There'll be, it's two different segments. So you can participate in band or chorus or both if, if they are um, on opposite days or they're not running at the same time. Um, so students have that flexibility. Um, one of the biggest challenges that we've found the last few years at the middle school is we have this ice block. That's existed forever. It technically stands for intervention, correction, and enrichment. And so, um, as Dr. Ackerman presented earlier, we're trying to do a lot of work providing students with just in time interventions. ICE kids did band, they did chorus, they did academic support, they um, may have gotten homework support or were, were, went with a counselor. It was so many different things that kids that had academic support may not have been able to participate. Um, I know this is not ideal. I know people are really unhappy with um, the fact that we're not able to offer it during the school day. 
Um, but as I said to my staff yesterday, there are only certain things that I can control. And I'm trying really hard to focus on the positive. So perhaps this will allow students to participate that maybe couldn't mm -hmm. previously. And it may also provide students the opportunity to get intervention during the school day that perhaps um, wasn't happening previously. So trying to look at that silver lining. Do we, this might be the end of the question. Do we still that. offer the repeat bus? For the yes, we do. So theoretically, depending on that time, yes. kids could go to this club and then take Yep, they could take the late bus home, yeah. as is offered for all of our other clubs. Um, <clears throat> I think I'm going to open this up to public, I'm assuming. <laughs> so again, I'll go through quickly through my quick you know, rules here. Uh, I'm not putting people on timers. Just we're all adults. We can talk and make decisions. Uh, so just I will all you all I ask. State your name and where you're from. So for public record, we have. Okay. Um, my name is Donna Dola. I'm. I live at 104 Newcomb Street. Um, first, I want to say that I'm sorry if I sound angry. Please understand that I am angry and upset about what has happened. This year is going to be really hard for those of us who work in the Northern Public Schools and have kids in the schools. We have lost a lot. This cannot just be the new normal, and we need to get back to basics. Let me tell you what getting back to basics means to me. It means having foreign language instruction at the middle school. It means having art and music instruction during the school day at all school buildings. Chorus and band should be happening during the school day. Music and art are part of a basic education. They are essential to a good education, and kids have higher test scores when they study music. But it needs to happen during the day and not after school, which will result in kids not being able to participate. Like my own daughter is now saying, if it's a club, she doesn't think she has time for it when she has volleyball, basketball, drama club, and other activities. So we wouldn't be having this conversation at home if this was still happening during the school day. So that's why I'm upset. So my question for each of you on the school committee is this. Are you all committed to figuring out a way to restore what has been lost? I need to know that you're all 100% committed to figuring this out. I don't know what the answers are, but this just can't be the new normal. We need to get back to having chorus and band at the middle school during the school day. We need to have art at the middle school during the school day. So I'm sorry again, like I, I am just really still feeling upset about what has happened. Um, I apologize, but that's how I feel. So. Yeah, I think just quickly, yeah, I mean, we all want what's best for the kids, you know, cutting art, music, any program isn't something that we want to, that we, you know, like to do. Um, you know, it's unfortunately we, you know, Dan said it a hundred times, we get handed a budget, you know, and we have to make do with what we got, you know, so unfortunately, we're not, we're in a position where hard decisions had to be made, you know, we, we took the superintendent's recommendations, uh, you know, we met multiple times, hundreds of times, I feel like. Yeah, you know, with, with, and, and, you know, <laughs> with those officials and everything else. So yeah, I mean, it's a challenge. It's not something that you know we'd like to do. Well, so I mean, in terms of being committed to fixing it, yes, yeah, we, we want to. You know, I, I think we all feel that same sentiment. Yeah, we we do want things back in our schools. It's it's a challenge. It is what it is. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know really what else to to say. I mean, you know, if, if something else got cut. You know, we would have multiple other parents here saying, hey, we don't want that. You know, we don't want that to be cut. It's a give and a take, unfortunately. It's a, it's a, it's a balance. It's hard. It's difficult. Anyone else? Is it okay if I sit? Yeah. I was like, you're not going to make me go up there. No. Uh, Karen Drain, um, uh, 6 North Washington Street. Um, the first question I have is just, I just want to be curious if um, everyone at the table, have, have you ever been to a band concert at Norton Public Schools? Yes. Yeah, my daughter was in band. My yeah. oldest daughter was I'll in the band conference. Okay. <laughs> so my my older daughter started band in the L, went through just about through the middle school. She stopped in seventh grade because she didn't want to do it. My <laughs> other daughter did chorus, never wanted to do the band. My son <laughs> didn't want to do either. <laughs> so I I have older children too. My children are beyond um, my youngest as a high schooler. So um, I haven't been to one since my children have not been involved, but one of the, 
the highlights, I actually still have the picture and video on my phone, um, was the all band night when the, all the children, that was probably the funnest night that I had with my daughter. I was not, I was in the band, but it was a before school program. I didn't feel like getting up, so it lasted about a couple of weeks for me. <laughs> and, you know, but I, Nick said it, I, we've said it, and, and and I don't want to step on your, your time. So when we have to cut any program, it, it's not something we do lightly. You know, we we talked about everything that we had to cut at length. Because we're the biggest department in the town, everything is multiplied when we have to cut something. We have 450-ish employees, obviously 26 less now. Um, we have the biggest piece of the budget, but it's only a piece of the budget that we get to work with. Um, I've been doing this 10 years. There was years where, I mean, unfortunately, the budget track record of my 10 years isn't great. Um, we've brought in fees. We've brought in um, transportation fees. We outsourced the cafeteria to try and save money. Um, we've done everything we could humanly do to keep. Sorry, I didn't want to cut you off, but that was just the start of my talk. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. That was my only question. That was just my only question. Um, oh my gosh, I lost my head. Sorry. Um, I didn't write it down. Um, but if, if you've been, you know that they're amazing. Uh, all band is amazing. And I, I'm sad to say is that uh, we may not have another band concert. Um, the high school is, I don't even know the numbers, but it could be a dozen. And I don't know if people know, but they need to bring in adult community members so that the high school band can actually play. Because a band is not 10 kids. That's not enough kids for a band. Um, and this after school program is, in my opinion, beginning year maybe two, and there will be one. Because there will be no filler, there will be no kids moving up to the high school band. Um, and my daughter is committing to um, a full year band in ninth grade. And I am worried that she's wasting her time. And that next year there won't be enough kids to hold band. Um, and I'm also worried that the ninth grade music teacher is not a band conductor because he was like a. So the music teacher who is teaching band doesn't actually teach band. She's great. She knows music. She's enthusiastic. I'm super excited about that. But she's not a band. So I did a little research. Um, I looked at our comparable schools. Um, I mean, uh, Pembroke, Rockland, Wareham, Swansea, Abington. There are comparables. Then I looked at our neighboring schools: Foxborough, Mansfield, Easton, Aberborough. Sorry, I didn't do time. They're kind of like a city. Felt like they maybe weren't comparable. Uh, West Bridgewater. I did that for you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All of them have banned in school fifth grade. They all have banned in high school. Some of them, Pem Pembroke is some sort of nationally recognized music school um, that has upwards of 300 kids in a marching band. Norton used to have a marching band. But I'm, I'm afraid the band is going to be lost. And so when I look at these comparable schools, then I say, how are we being competitive in our music programs compared to our neighboring students? How are we being competitive for kids that want to do that? My daughter started flute in fourth grade. She endured during COVID, which was not easy. And she has played now, um, now into uh, coming into the ninth grade. Um, and so realistically, she would play until she was her senior. And she may have gone to competitions and field trips and festivals, but she's not going to be able to do that. And so I'm wondering is what is the plan here? I mean, I don't have any faith that this after school program is going to work. Um, if you're going to find somebody, if kids are going to be able to go, um, we are lucky. I'm lucky that my daughter is in ninth grade now, so we don't need to worry about the after school band, but we do, because, I mean, the middle school band, because there will be no kids to fall. Um, but are we, are we really looking at no music program, no band, and no chorus in a year or two? And are you all okay with that? Thank you. Sorry, I think that was it. Is that it? Okay. Um, Karen, thank you. Thank you guys all for being here. Um, 
I think those who know me know I'm not okay with this, right? right. You, the people that know me and know me well know, know I'm not okay with this. Um, Donna, you talked about um, how students do better when they have art and music and all of these opportunities. Um, we were faced with an impossible situation this year, you know, looking to cut 3.7, 3. Point, you know, whatever million dollars um, in a budget where, contrary to popular belief, there's not a lot of fat to trim. And so none of these decisions feel good. As I told our staff yesterday during our opening convocation, 26 less is a lot of people. There are a lot of things that are going to suffer this year. And it's not the fault of our student, right? I don't feel good about any of these things. I don't feel good about, you know, thinking about Daniela having to choose between volleyball and, and band and, and everything else. And I know she's one of many students that are making those decisions. They, the, the, unfortunately, these are our options. Well, and, and I, yeah, I, I don't feel like this is at all directed at you. I think what I'm extremely disappointed in as a town is that we couldn't get unanimous support from the select board and the, the school committee and all our town boards to say this is the this is the reality and why we couldn't support the an override even if it wasn't the full six point five million like at least get us some money I guess I'm still really upset about that that because people were saying like oh there's lots of waste well show us where that is show us show us your ideas for moving forward that if, if you think that there's all this stuff that we could trim instead so that we add back band and chorus and whatever like I I want you guys to step up. And show us real leadership now. That's and I'm sorry. I know I sound extremely angry, but this is where we are. And I feel like people have said, "Oh, but there's other things we can trim." And now's the time to show us what that is. Well, I mean, I, and I I take your point. I don't take it very lightly. You know, that was the biggest thing is when we looked at the fat of our budget. It's not. We just eliminated two programs from our schools that were sought after. I, I, my youngest, as I mentioned, is in high school, had middle school foreign language. As a sophomore, she passed the seal of biliteracy as a sophomore in French. First sophomore to do it at Northern High School and still has two more years of French. Yeah. She had an advantage and she still has an advantage. And you know, so when we, I, that was the most frustrating thing is you have excess, you have excess. We don't, we, we don't because we just cut what should be considered core programming. It's not, it's, it's not considered core programming. That's the bottom line. Um, and, and that's, it's a very frustrating thing. And, you know, we, we were all frustrated. I mean, whether it was for or against the override, you're talking about 26 people that were let go. I'm sure there was a trickle down effect of some people that said, you know what, I'm going to go to another district. So take that 26. And yes, we had to, like, we have to, you know, replace some people that decided that Norton wasn't where they wanted to continue to work. Um, you know, there is, there will be more discussions on what next year's budget looks like. And I would like to be optimistic and say it's going to be better. Well, that's why I'm saying I think now's the time for people to step up and show leadership because they seem to say that they had ideas and I, I'm waiting to hear those ideas. Yeah, Nobody's that. actually said any ideas. Yeah. I mean, people on the select board, school committee, like, I think the solution is to just cut more, just keep cutting. So uh, there it is. Anyone else? Yep. Yeah. Oh, you can talk. Um, Jen Colassi, 73 Harvey Street. I just wanted to talk about the social impact that cutting band and course has during the day. Because like Karen mentioned, I don't see it going to after school. Like Ben has already said, I'm not participating after school. But what band and course does for kids who are not sports kids or drama kids, it gives them a sense of belonging. And we have to look at it going forward. If we lose it in middle school, 
we're not going to have it in high school. In high school is when kids can get lost. Kids who don't have that sense of belonging can get lost in that shuffle. If I didn't have that, I probably wouldn't have made it through high school. Um, so we need to think about the effects that it has, not only academically, but what it's going to do to our high school kids. My son is shy. He plays sports. He's not academic. He's not a sports kid. He's not going to make it in high school on a baseball team, but he had the band. He did well in drugs. He's, he, I'm afraid he's going to get off. I'm afraid there's a lot of other kids that that's going to happen to too. So if we don't look at restoring it now, we're going to lose so many kids, I think. They can just go through the cracks. There one more over there, I thought. Yep. No? <laughs> Hello, my name is Val Cabral and I live at 50 Mansfield Avenue, which I'm pretty sure everyone here knows at this point. This, these particular cuts really upset me. I'm not addressing this, by the way, to the folks who responded to my email to the, select, to, to the school committee saying that they did in fact support trying to save the schools. So some of you might find this a little pointed. I pulled this out a number of times during the budget and override discussions over the course of the last few months and the folks who were gunning for cuts to the schools didn't seem to care. Those of us who did band and chorus and sports and drama and non-school extracurriculars like dance or riding horseback. There are plenty of other activities that could be counted here, but those were mine. All of them are things I did as a child in school. We would have been completely left out by a plan like this. And I grew up, as I've stated many times before, in a town that Karen named half the size of Norton and with a lower median income, both of which are true to this day, they still managed and continue to manage to give kids choir and band from elementary through high school. Something like this would have been a huge hit to my school experience and we're seeing exactly this happen to a lot of kids, like the kids who've been mentioned here who are having to choose. Parents are already calling it out. Moving band and chorus to after school both does a disservice to the kids who love those activities and to their future prospects because they'll be less well-rounded and therefore less competitive if they choose to apply to college after graduating. That was a huge thing for me and I graduated from high school 20 years ago. You had to be well-rounded. You needed all these extracurriculars and in this day and age, kids do need to look good on an application if that's where they wanna go. Unless their parents manage to pay for private lessons, which is passing on costs to families instead of coming together as a community to support the kids, and which also make sure that kids who don't live in rich families are not going to be able to pay for those lessons, it's unlikely that they're going to get anywhere if they have to start band in high school, and they're probably just not going to start, and we're not going to have a program. So those of you who tirelessly advocated not for the kids of this town, but instead for budget cuts, should be ashamed of yourselves. Thanks, Mel. You're welcome. Anyone else? I have heard, oh, sorry. Can I just put one more thing? Because I remember I said I thought I forgot something. I, forgot. I just wanted to mention that in Attleboro, the kids in the middle school do a track where they either take band as a class or they take general music. So the kids who are band take their music as band. And so as something to consider, it would mean blowing up the middle school um, way of doing specials and such, but it is something to think about to how other schools have been able to so, sorry, that was the only thing I mentioned, and I got yesterday. Thank you. Peter? Peter Wayne, Barbara, I thought when Peter met the Avenue and during the budget season, I pledged hard to keep this moving, and, and I ignored all the nastiness on social media about the overrides, and I ignored it with ease and People need to be kind in social media when it comes to, to not in schools and the cuts and people need to be kind in social media, correct? Sure. Right. Thanks, Peter. Yeah. Uh, Jason Chen was saying earlier. I'm Jen Farley. I live in town. I'm a mom. I work for the You just state your address, sorry, for public records. 21 Woodward Street. Thanks. I was a band student. I wasn't an athlete. I wasn't. Um, I was a good student, but I wasn't at the top of the class. Band was my family. I was also in chorus. I was better in band than I was in chorus, but I was afforded those opportunities in the middle school. I did not grow up in Norton. I grew up in East Providence, so slightly different. 
But we had a band that our entire community was proud of. It started at a middle school level and it was a feeder program to our high school. We were invited to play in different states. We were invited to compete. And when I came to Norton, I went to my first grade. I'm like, this is going to be fantastic. I love a great marching band. And the band came by. And my heart broke because I remember the adrenaline of marching down, <coughs> whether it was Riverside, whether it was the Bristol Fourth of July parade, knowing I needed to make it past the TV cameras before I passed out in the William <laughs> because Brandy was watching on TV. But there was a sense of pride. And then it made me a better student because I was a good student, but some of my classes were difficult. Some of my teachers were very long winded and it made for a long class. But when you had band thrown in, it rejuvenated. And like I said before, that was my team. That was my band. And when we took the field at a halftime show, our sports teams, they looked to us for more motivation. So it was just a nice relationship back and forth. I know we're here and right now, this is the best we have. But every student learns differently. And for some of our struggling readers or students who are struggling in math, it might be the arts where they thrive. And I just don't want them to lose more opportunities, especially music, art. My eighth grader is devastated because there's no art. That's her outlet. So now we have to look at other avenues so she can still feel creative and share her time. <clears throat> so again, I know we're here right now, but please keep in mind that every student learns in different avenues and different pathways. And, you know, it would be really awesome if we built up our band and when we had our parade, we were shining. It's, it's a deep power. So that's my two cents. But it's a team. It's a family. Thanks, Jeff. Right. Um, Amy Martin, Four Bullet Drive. Is there a way, and I know Jen touched on this a little bit, is there a way to either restructure or use those ice blocks to bring any kind of band course art back into the school this year, or is it too hard to, or is that not even possible? Um, it would require rehiring um, another teacher. Oh. Thank you, Amy. All right. Uh, let's go on to number seven of other business, uh, not reasonably anticipated in 48 hours. Okay. Nope. I have nothing. I'm not actually thinking. Well, you can go first. All right, you can go first. Okay. Right. <laughs> um, I just wanted to see, I know, and I know it's probably been a crazy few months, a month here anyway, uh, school start times. Yes. We'll have an update for you guys um, at the first meeting in October. Perfect. And then um, addressing the letter. Obviously, I think we just got on Tuesday um, from the high school academic coordinators. Um, I would assume you could probably just add that to the next meeting. I didn't know exactly just because we all did get it. Yeah, um, you guys can certainly add it. We can add to the September 11th meeting if you like. Perfect. I just wanted to respond to give them a chance as well. Uh, that was it for me. Um, okay, so uh, earlier this afternoon, we were. Um, alerted by the Mass Teachers Retirement System that we will be one of the lucky districts to undergo an audit this year, um, which uh, requires us sharing all of our employee census data and pension information um, from the 2023 school. So um, that's always fun when you find out you get something else to add to your plate. So um, Christine and Courtney and Donna will probably be busy organizing um, that information uh, to share with them. Um, Who's it from again? Sorry. It's from the Mass Teachers Retirement System. So the state audit um, happens every 10 years, it's our turn. Um, and so that's yes. due by the uh, December 31st. So great. That is the list. So that's be done by the 31st? <laughs> oh. Surprising. Um, anything else? Motion, oh, come back. Yes, yes, welcome back to the uh, well, actually, all four of us attended to the, the teachers' welcome back, which I thought was really well. Um, mm -hmm. starting up, it's a crazy time, indeed, it is.
and I attended the finite saw the sixth grade orientation and it went very well and it was the first sixth grade class that I was part of at a new school back in 1998. Awesome. 26 years. <laughs> 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 so that's why like, yeah. Uh, so what was the favorite? Yeah. 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 Yeah